It's hard to come here without seeing my mama in this place. She loved you guys so much. I, right when I walked through the door, I saw her. Not in a vision, but in memory. And it's looking down at this altar, that's, that's where she would come and praise God just about every time she was in this place. She always did. Always yes, sir. And she's doing that more today than she ever did before. <laughs> but before the throne room of God, not before a stage with a few steps and a wooden altar. She's seeing Him face to face and her faith is sight. And that's what I'm living for. That's what I'm dying for. I was telling my uncle when we were driving here, I don't know how people make it without God. <laughs> what hope is there out there? We all face enough and then not to have anything to look forward to. Good Lord. <laughs> how do they make it? Must be why those drive throughs are so active. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 5. I heard Tammy mention that she's sensitive to, to smells or something. It reminded me of a, a story. When we were younger, she took me to a political rally right after I broke my neck. And I had this cologne called Axe Lab. <laughs> Axe Lab, I loved it when I was in high school. I was about 18 years old when this happened. She took me with Paul. I don't know if you remember him, the foreign exchange guy from Germany. Paul? Yeah. Yeah. And I went a little hard on the Axe Lab. <laughs> and I was sitting in the passenger seat beside Tammy driving to that rally. I think it was a Sarah Palin rally or something. I have no idea. In Chillicothe, Ohio. And she rolled her window down and was driving with her head on the window the whole way to Chillicothe. Gagging and choking and having an asthma attack over my axe lab. <laughs> so she's not wrong. Second Kings five verse nine. I've been looking at this, been studying this a little bit, been thinking about it, talking about it in my humble efforts to serve God elsewhere which aren't that great, but it is a great God that I serve and a great honor to serve yes. Him yes, in any capacity, whether great or small. The Bible says this, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, angry, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he says, Wash and be clean. Then the Bible says, the 14th verse, He went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like the flesh of a child. And he was clean. Let's pray really quickly, please. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. This is all about you, Jesus. Let it be all about you. Let it be all for you. I can't do this without you. Without you, we can do nothing. We ask for your anointing today. That our minds and our hearts be single and focused upon you. And that we seek your glory and not our own. And that your word would go forth and that souls would be saved. Souls would be edified. Your spirit will move. Your spirit would anoint me to do what only you can do. Bless your word. Bless everybody who's come here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I've said before when speaking of this, if you've grown up in Sunday school, if you've grown up in church, if you've been exposed to the Bible in any measure, you definitely have heard this story. 
Naaman the leper. It's very familiar to me. I've heard it several times. I remember a cartoon when I was younger, my mama had, called Naaman the leper. <laughs> they depicted him pretty poorly. I don't know if his forehead was that big, but he... <laughs> They showed the story, and I still remember that today when thinking about this, and pretty accurate to Scripture. But you know the story, this man of notoriety, of power, of status, wealthy, got sick. And he got sick with a disease that was terminal, that ate your flesh away, that took away your, your limbs, and that killed you in a short amount of time. And he, the man that was highly esteemed with great status and reverence amongst men, was about to be demoted to the lowly, disgusting, smelly outcast, the lepers. And this man is not used to that. He's proud. He's a champion and a man of valor in battle. But he has a little servant girl that they took captive from Israel. You know the story. Once he gets leprosy, she told his wife, <laughs> there's a prophet in Israel. Lord, God. <laughs> That's good. And he has the power of God upon him to recover your leprosy. And the story here again is not physical healing. As we all know, we pray for everybody that's sick, but not everybody who's sick gets healed. But this is more a type of salvation and merit from God and isolated in his scenario, Naaman, a proud man from Syria. And he takes the word of this girl, talks to his king about it. His king says, go to Samaria. The girl told his wife, there's a prophet in Samaria who has the power of God and he can heal your husband, my master. Naaman says, I got nothing to lose. So he loads up everything that he has that is impressive, his wealth, his status, everything else, and he brings it to the doorstep of the prophet Elisha, humbling himself to that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going to those, the nation that they were above, already humbling himself. He who has been humbled by disease. And he humbles himself to the point of going to a man beneath him, seeking help. But he comes with gold and silver and, and raiment, everything that's costly, yeah. and probably the finest. He was wearing Versace. <laughs> he had a Gucci <laughs> chariot, I don't know, <laughs> a Mercedes. <laughs> that's <pretty good. laughs> and he brought all that to Elisha. And the Bible said the prophet wouldn't even come out and talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy, this nothing, nobody prophet, doesn't even pay him the time of day and acknowledge him by coming outside to talk to him. And he came all the way with all his status and all his expense and wealth to this guy's doorstep and he doesn't even come out and talk to him. He sends a messenger outside and tells him, go wash in the Jordan River seven times. And Jordan is dirty. <laughs> Muddy waters. Muddy waters. And he is offended beyond belief. This would be but like a billionaire of today coming to a very humble, poor individual's house, putting themselves beneath themselves to even step out and associate with that person. That person not even acknowledging them. You can put it in today's life, I guess, to illustrate it. But the prophet wouldn't take his money. Eventually when he's healed, he tries to pay the man. The prophet wouldn't take it. And it's not wrong to get paid to do God's work. It's not wrong. Jesus said a workman is worthy of his hire. And when he sent his apostles out, he said, whatever they give you, take it. It's not wrong. You need sponsorship sometime if it's your full-time career to, to work for God. But this was a type of merit, a type of salvation. And when those things are concerned, meriting from God, we cannot buy them. That's right. So God wouldn't take his silver. God wouldn't take his gold. God wouldn't take his status. But to heal the man of leprosy, God gave the prophet a simple word. Go tell him to wash 
in muddy Jordan. <laughs> Baptize yourself in muddy waters. You rich and famous man who has the best of everything. And he talks to his servants. He says, I'm going home. I'm done with this. There's cleaner waters. I'm not putting myself in that muddy river. Raccoon Creek ain't going to touch my skin. <laughs> I'm not going under that water. And he says, I'm going home. And finally, somebody has the sense to talk some sense into him and to reason with him a little bit. They say, Naaman, buddy, you're dying. Dude, you're dying. And he's asking you to do something so simple. And all it's going to take is a little bit of humility. And when it came to the healing of this man, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, Jehovah, through the prophet, knew what the man's problem was. His problem wasn't that he was a leper. His problem was his pride. And so the solution that God gave did not so much address his physical ailment, but the ailment of his heart in that it would be resolved so that he could put himself in a position where God's supernatural power could touch him. Leprosy wasn't his problem. Pride wasn't. God says, you go get muddy. You humble yourself. I'll touch you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And He'll exalt you in due time. And when Naaman realizes, okay, I'll take my Versace. I'll take my Gucci. I'll baptize it in muddy waters. I'll take my sacred skin that carries the perfume of the finest ointment of Syria. I'll get in the Jordan River. And I won't wash one time. I'll wash seven times. Seven, the number of perfection. I'll go down seven times. (laughs) And he came up. The Bible says his flesh was as the flesh of a little child. Not a blemish. Not a spot. Washed clean of his disease. And there's a lot there. Obviously, humility is not the primary or is not the only thing here, although it'd be potentially primary. You could argue a lot of things. Neil and Eric need to start a podcast or something. (laughs) I've had some conversations with them. But the primary thing God addressed was the disease of his heart, which was his pride and his sin. And when he humbled himself, he met the power of God. I want to illustrate this through current events, if I can. America is a land with all our sickness and our disease and the leprosy we see in the culture and society, America is proud still somehow. And God has presented to us a solution. It's obvious politically, spiritually. I don't belong to a political party. I hate politics, if you want me to be honest. I don't like it. I butted heads with it and met the wrong, the, the, the wrath of it. <laughs> I don't like it. I love them. I don't have anything bad to say about anybody. But there's somebody who God has given to this nation who's a little rough, a little harsh, and he'll rub you the wrong way if you're a little too sensitive. But if he gets back in the White House, God willing, if we repent and pray, America's going to do a lot better than she is now. And we have a pathway of nothing else, not knowing what the times are, believing Jesus Christ could come at any moment, but occupy until He come. We have a way where this nation can at least have a four-year window of blessing and prosperity. And I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. That's it. <laughs> but I talked to somebody the other day, and they said, essentially, I don't care if He's good for us. I can't stand the things He says. And I'm not here to promote a man. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. This is an illustration of what I'm talking about. But they said, I don't care. I can do without his mean tweets. And I said, brother, America's going to hell. (laughs) We we have leprosy. We're dying. And there's nothing else in front of us. We got two choices. 
We, we go on with this leprosy and die. In case you haven't noticed, we're dying. It's, it's, there's not much time left for this country if we keep going the way we're going. Jesus is coming. That's it. That's the primary. But at the same time, there, there could be a four-year window for revival for all these lost souls. But the pride of many would not prefer this. And I know, listen, I know when I say these things, I understand. I can, I can sense it. I can feel it. People say you got something to lose. It doesn't matter. We're all going to lose. <laughs> We're all going to lose. Nobody's got anything to gain with the way things are going. But they said they would rather have things keep going the way they're going and the ultimate destruction of this God-blessed nation and to have a personality that they do not prefer. And honestly, I'm on board with some of that. I don't like insults. I don't like harsh behavior. But I'm not bigger than God. <clears throat> and I understand somebody of, of his class and status could definitely handle themselves a lot better in certain scenarios. But maybe he has to be that way. I don't know. At the same time, you think about the weaponization of media and, and the judicial branches across this nation. That's just as bad. So you could point a finger in either direction. But, <laughs> just the same, if God would, and if we would, it would be good <laughs> if this man came back into office. You can't win if you're me here. I prayed about this. I said, God, do you want me to say this? He said, say it. <laughs> I had something else I wanted to say. He said, say this. Super Tuesday. I work for him. <laughs> I work for God. I don't care what anybody says. But I recognize for the sake of the world, we really have no choice. Give me liberty. Give me death. I don't care if you don't like the way he acts. It's pretty obvious that one is better than the other. And this one is going to hurt us. We keep going the way we're going. And if there is time between the coming of the Lord and, and a space for the mercy of God Almighty to touch this nation, we know what we have to do. But it's going to take the United States of America, figuratively speaking, politically, humbling themselves. And again, I'm not talking about politics here, even though that's an illustration of what I'm talking about. But some people... And he'll win any fair election, it's obvious. I don't know why his primary opponent's still running. Even against the, the man who calls himself president now, God save us, so he'll mop the floor with him in a fair legal election. But some people, again, not the majority, because he'll mop the floor, humor the illustration, would not prefer God's method of healing economically, politically for this nation than they would rather their own preference because it's not what they want. And I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm a Christian, and it's pretty clear, obviously, one person stands by this book yes. more than any other. Yeah. Abortion's wrong, guys, I'm sorry. Yes. Amen. I don't care who it rubs the wrong way, I don't care who gets angry. Abortion's wrong, homosexuality's wrong, we're going to hell. Yeah. If God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, He'll judge us. And that's how I make my decision when it comes to elections. And that's how we all should. But for some people, it will take humility to swallow their preferential desire and admit, you know what? We have to go with this person that I would not prefer. Because he is, figuratively speaking, economically, politically, a Jordan River. Spiritually speaking, individually speaking, it's that way for all of us across the board. <clears throat> Mud and water <laughs> go together with God. You don't need water if you don't have mud. There's nothing to wash if you've got nothing to wash. <laughs> and what mud represents, you've got the muddy Jordan River God tells the leper to go wash in. What mud represents is the reality and the humility 
and an admission of that to God. What we are, what it is, Naaman may have been a man of status and wealth and power, but he was a leper and seemingly in denial of it, even though accepting it to the point of coming to the prophet's doorstep, but in denial of it when it came to admission and confession to God and acceptance of his way. And God says, go put some mud on yourself in front of me and humble yourself according to my word through my servant, the prophet, the type of the Bible, the word of God, prophecy. Humility to accept, humility to admit mud, the muddy waters, baptize me in muddy waters. (laughs) There's a country music song that says that, right? Trace Adkins. Baptize me in the muddy waters. In the Old Testament, when, they, when a nation was sick and sinful and in danger of judgment, they clothed themselves in sackcloth and seat themselves in ashes. And in doing so, symbolically speak to God and say, God, this is who we are. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, cover themselves in ashes. I'm torn apart, I'm broken, I'm in need of God. An act of supreme humility symbolically through the outer speaking to God in the outer realms of the heavens. There's no power in mud and water. Jesus is the power. (laughs) It's the symbolism and the faith and the humility that brought healing to this mighty man. And that he admitted he he wasn't so big, he wasn't so mighty, that he's bigger than God's choice and God's ways. You don't have to marry the Jordan River. (laughs) You don't have to spend the rest of your life with it. But when it came down to it, he had no choice. (laughs) It was death or it was Jordan. Muddy waters or leprosy for the rest of his life. Sackcloth and ash, the same principle revealed in mud and water. A type of confession, a type of admitting a need, admitting reality and truth in order to merit from God faith. When he humbled himself, embraced the truth of who he was and what was going on in his life and the situation, he merited what God said. I've been to the doctor before. I remember many years ago. I was sick. I was really sick. I don't know what I had, but been a while, but I sat down in his room for examination. He walked in <laughs> and he sat down with his stethoscope and his white jacket and whatever else they have, his name tag and his something. And he said, so how are you doing today? <laughs> I was like, I'm great. <laughs> Barely able to talk. I don't need you. <laughs> then why'd you come here? <laughs> How many have done that? (laughs) You feel horrible. I'm great. (laughs) Give me a prescription (laughs) for something I don't need. (laughs) I had to tell him what was going on. What the problem? I'm sick. (laughs) You've got the ability to write me the, hopefully, no WHO medication (laughs) for my health. I had to put some figurative mud on myself and this is what it is. We dress ourselves up for the world. You understand what's going on here? Go wash in the muddy water. We act out what we want people to think is reality. But God says, I want you to admit and to confess what is reality. Mud. (laughs) I'm dirty. I'm sick. I need you, Father. Humble yourself. Confess a type of confession and humility. And that was the formula for this proud man's healing. When he embraced that and overcame his greatest fall, he found the power of God and found healing for his illness. In the ninth chapter of John, Jesus healed a blind man using this same formula. Mud and water. Muddy water. You know the story. This man had been born blind, the Bible says, from his birth. He never had seen. 
And it was not sin committed on his behalf, as was made clear in Scripture, that caused his blindness. But it was a state of sin, nonetheless, back to Eden that had brought his blindness. Jesus said he didn't sin, his parents didn't sin, but sin still is the cause. So Jesus spits on the ground, he makes mud, and he puts mud on the man's face, on his eyes, on his forehead, and dresses this man up in mud. He puts mud on his eyes. And he tells him, you go walk in front of everybody with mud on your face and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpreted scent. And this man, already humbled, already very humble, unable to even understand the potential condemning gaze of fellow man, goes, probably led by the hand or stumbling along the way with a stick, with a staff, finds the pool, finds his way there, and gets this mud washed off his face. I don't know about you, but it's, it'd be humbling for me to walk around with mud on my face and my forehead. <laughs> mud and water. But Jesus said, put it on, let me put it on your face. Let's talk about the, what's going on here. Let's, let's dress it up like it is. Like it really is. Let's not parade around like this ain't a problem. Like this hasn't bothered you your whole life. Let's let everybody know what this is. Let's let my Father know what this is. Let's typically, symbolically, represent confession and admission. And then by faith, go get the water. Go get the water. The washing of the water of His Word. The cleansing of the blood. And without mud, you don't need water. The Pharisees, the religious leadership, heard Jesus talking. Jesus said, for judgment, I am coming to the world. (laughs) That they which see not might see the blind they see. That's verse 39. And that they which see might be made blind. That's a riddle. (laughs) And the Pharisees, these hypocritical, pathetic religious leaders who puffed themselves in front of men, Constantly putting on a show of holiness and righteousness, condemning anybody for any slight flaw that they had. Walking around, followed Jesus everywhere He went. Criticizing, critiquing. Oh, He should have done this. He's a sinner. He's from Satan. They're there. And they are so offended by what Jesus said. They said, are we blind too? Are we blind also? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see. So your sin remains. No mud on their face. Do you get it? No mud on their face. (laughs) They put forth the show of perfect soundness, wholeness, because they said this sin caused this. Sin is evidence of this. We don't have sin. Unwilling to figuratively clothe themselves in mud in in the face of God, in the face of the public, and admit their own state and status. Thus, they're blind. Thus, they can't have His healing power. But the man who was willing to let the Son of God put mud all over his face in front of everybody and walk around in front of everybody with mud on his face, he could wash and be made clean. He could wash and be made clean. There are individuals in this world, my friend, especially in the realm of religion, maybe even in the realm of society, who like Naaman are too big and too bad, who like these Pharisees, too big for God to touch. Too good at what they do and unwilling to let God touch them. They want to buy. They want to merit their goodness, their righteousness. But what did Jesus say? (laughs) Mud and water. (laughs) Mud and water. The water washes away, but without the mud, you don't need the water. Without the mud, you don't need the water. This is step one to salvation. This is step one to merit from God. Humility and confession. Faith. 
when we humble ourselves, the Bible says, if my people humble themselves. I've talked about this before here many years ago. The woman with the issue of blood. More than Naaman had leprosy, he had pride and God addressed it. And for many of us, we need a little mud, we need a little water. I know this nation does, I know we individually do, especially in the times we're living in. It has never before in history looked more like Jesus Christ is coming. But if you don't need Him, if you're too good for Him, if you're too strong, if you're not weak enough to find His strength, you're not going to find it. And neither will I. Without me, you can do nothing, He said. When we humble ourselves and pray, we have no other choice. John chapter 6, Jesus offended a large group of people in front of Him. He said, except you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life. The Bible said they were so offended that many of them turned away and walked away from Him. And He asked the disciples, are you going to go away as well? And they said, who are we going to? (laughs) You alone have the words of life. Nobody else can heal. Nobody else can save. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, all for Jesus. To put it simply, my friend, it's Jesus Christ, the way, truth, and the life, or it's death and hell. In every category. But for us to get to Him, it takes admission, it takes confession, figuratively muddy water, just like Naaman. If we have to clothe ourselves in the sight of God with a little mud on our forehead, if we have to put on sackcloth and ash, figuratively, spiritually, not literally, none of that stuff really matters anymore. Unless God specifies. If we humble ourselves and pray, we'll find a way for God to heal, for God to save, for God to forgive, tap into His miracle working power, which we need now more than ever. Let's put a little mud on ourselves so we can use that water. Humility. And I know, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but whoever, under the sound of my voice, mud and water, if it be permitted, (laughs) you get political, they'll hack you. Mud and water. Mud and water. Put mud on, and you got something to wash off. God can't wash you. If you don't admit it, if you don't, I'm sick. Naaman came with all his money. This is who I am. You do this for me because that's who I am. God said, this is who I am. This is who you are. Admit it and I'll do that for you. (laughs) Mud and water. I'm going to smear some mud on my forehead tonight. And today. (laughs) Or before I walk out those doors. God, this is who I am. Without you, I can do nothing. I need you all. I need you. Every hour, I need you. Bless me now, my Savior. Without Him, I could do nothing. Without Him, I'd surely fail. I can't live without you. I can't walk without you. I can't talk without you. Mud, wash me, Lord. Wash us clean. The church is rich, increased with goods, has need of nothing in these days. And they're putting on a show and entertainment to try to fill their seats. No mud, no water, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Let's put some mud on so God can wash us clean for His coming and that He can use us in these last days to shine the light for a lost and dying world. If we humble ourselves and pray, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. We are weak. We are nothing. I'm not coming to God with my silver and gold. I don't have much of it. (laughs) But I'm not coming with whatever I have or whatever I can bring. I'm coming with some mud and I'm going to go down and baptize myself in the same river Jesus Christ will be baptized in and find healing power and the power of God. God. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we love You. We praise You. We come humbly. 
Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. You did it all. <laughs> I can't do it. We can't do it. Without you, we can do nothing. We need you. We don't have the resources. We don't have the power. It's your spirit. It's your salvation. It's your cross. We come today with figuratively mud upon our flesh because that's who we are. We are dust. We're nothing. And we're dirty. Wash us with the washing of the water of the Word. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Make us whole. Make us clean. We humble ourselves before you. We come humbly. We come boldly. And we ask you to move. We ask you to touch us and to anoint us. Move upon us, Lord God. Help us to be ready for your coming. Give us mercy until that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.